the committee will come to order. Uh, let me uh, thank everyone for their patience uh, and indulgence uh, and apologize for the vicissitudes of our voting schedule, and we're sorry for uh, any inconvenience. I will start this hearing as we do all of our uh, oversight hearings by reading the mission statement. We exist to secure two fundamental principles. First, Americans have a right to know that the money Washington takes from them is well spent. And second, Americans deserve an efficient, effective government that works for them. Our duty on the Oversight and Government Reform Committee is to protect these rights. Our solemn responsibility is to hold government accountable to taxpayers because taxpayers have a right to know what they get from their government. We will work tirelessly in partnership with citizen watchdogs to deliver the facts to the American people and bring genuine reform to the Federal bureaucracy. This is the mission of the Oversight and Government Reform Committee. If the uh, witnesses would like, they can come to the uh, table at this point. Thank you. I will uh, recognize myself for an opening and then recognize the gentleman from Illinois. The purpose of the Oversight Committee is not necessarily to balance the relative merits or demerits of a law or proposed legislation. Other committees do that. Our oversight is calculated to ensure trust and confidence in the institutions of government, to investigate areas that demand transparency and accountability. Our duty is to ask fair questions with an expectation of an honest and complete answer on behalf of the people we represent. That is why we are here today. Many in this room, including myself, fundamentally oppose the health care legislation passed last year. We have serious concerns with Federal mandates on individual citizens and massive new government spending programs in such an austere fiscal environment. But those conversations are reserved for other forums. The current health care law was marketed to the American people as a means to provide high quality health coverage options to every citizen in our country, while ensuring that those who like their current coverage can keep it. Over the past year, it has become abundantly clear that companies are having trouble complying with the new law. In order to escape the onerous burdens placed on businesses by this legislation, many of these companies have sought waivers from the Secretary for Health and Human Services with varying levels of success. The necessity of these waivers arose because many companies employ a health coverage strategy that provides some employees with many med plans that run afoul of current Federal rules mandated by the new health care law that set a minimal annual dollar limit on essential benefits that health care plans must provide in 2011, 2012, and 2013. Thus, the myth that if you like your current health care, you can keep it has been exposed for about 3 million employees. Through an amorphous process shrouded in ambiguity and understood by few, the administration has exempted over 1,000 companies from certain requirements and at the same time has neglected to afford others the same accommodation. So our first question today is substantive. In light of over 1,000 companies requesting waivers from the burdens of this law, what did the President mean when he said, if you like your health insurance, you can keep it? And what are the failings of this law that necessitates a waiver process to begin with? Further, the entire waivers process is predicated on the ability of the Secretary to grant waivers in the first instance. However, this seemingly fundamental step, the statutory basis for waiving compliance with the law, appears to have been wholly neglected by the plain language of the statute. So what is the legal authority by which the Secretary can grant waivers? Where in the health care law does it specifically grant the Secretary the authority to waive compliance with the law? Congress all too often in recent memory has abdicated its lawmaking responsibilities to employees or appointees in the executive branch who are not elected and are not accountable via popular election to the American people. It is not Congress's job to simply pass big ideas and leave the details to another entity. And it is also not the job of agencies to invent statutory authority where none exists. However, the most important questions today concern the procedural aspects of this highly nebulous process. Initially, how were these waivers advertised before a link was placed on the HHS website? What was the process by which subsequent waivers were applied for, reviewed, accepted, denied, determined, and appealed? The American people expect open and honest answers to these legitimate questions. 
Waivers to the health care law have widespread implications, implications that demand transparency and accountability from the Federal Government. In order for companies to compete on a level playing field, as is the custom in our country, they must know their burden of proof, the standards their applications will be evaluated by. They must know why certain companies' applications were accepted and others denied. There must be an identifiable process, not a labyrinthine morass of vague standards with no statutory defini definitions. The waivers process, such as it is, lends credence to the conventional wisdom surrounding enactment of this transformative law. People don't know what is in it or how specific provisions are affecting American businesses and individuals. These due process, equal protection, and fundamental fairness questions that are essential to be asked and also to be answered. And I will now recognize the distinguished ranking member, Mr. Davis, for his opening statement. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Let me just say that uh, in the relatively short time that you have been chairman, you have selected two hearings that I think are very important. And I thank you for, first of all, dealing with education, making sure or trying to make sure that all of our citizens have access, and especially those in the City of Washington, D.C., but also dealing with health care, which is what we are going to be discussing today. And so I thank you for yielding. Um, the subcommittee's first hearing on the issue of improving access to quality of public education, and the second one we convened for the subcommittee's hearing to discuss how best to ensure the public's access to quality health care coverage. Given the significance of these two issues for the American people, I think the subcommittee is off to a great start. However, I do want to point out that our colleagues on the Energy and Commerce Committee conducted a similar hearing on this topic less than a month ago that pretty much already answered the question as to why the waivers are needed during the three-year implementation period. So it is my hope that today's hearing will actually provide us a chance to conduct oversight of HHS's Minimed waiver process with the intent of discussing how the process could be improved versus spending our time debating whether such a process should even exist. With the one-year anniversary of the enactment of the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act just a little over a week away. Today's hearing entitled Obamacare, Why the Need for Waivers, basically helps to show why passing health care reform and ensuring quality affordable coverage for all Americans was so important. The landmark legislation called for the end of low-cost, mini-med, health plans, which offer far too many hardworking Americans inadequate benefits and a false sense of protection. While the elimination of lifetime and annual limits of the amount of coverage to be paid by health insurance plan was a key aspect of health care reform, no one really expected this sweeping and monumental change to be fully implemented overnight. This is why the Act envisioned a transition period between 2010 and 2014 to allow for the reasonable conversion of millions of people from poorly designed limited benefit plans to plans that provide more comprehensive health care coverage. I understand that in order to get us to the point of where all Americans have access to enhanced health care coverage, the Secretary of Health and Human Services is gradually phasing out these substandard plans in a manner that does not subject consumers to hefty premium increases or reduce overall access to coverage. Hence, the issuance of one-year waivers to businesses that have demonstrated their inability to meet new coverage limits this year. Despite claims to the contrary, HHS's Section 1001 waiver process has been transparent, as evidenced by the multiple publication of regulations 
governing process in the Federal Register and the wealth of information and guidance on the annual limit waiver application process available to HHS's website. In addition to transparency, the process has also been fair, as more than 94 percent of applicants who applied for waivers received them, and let the record show that most of the waivers issued went to non-union plans. In fact, the waiver process we are discussing this afternoon may actually serve as a best practice of good governance example for other agencies to follow when engaging American public and business community. So, Mr. Chairman, I am glad that today's hearing provides us an opportunity to discuss some of the benefits of the Affordable Care Act as its ultimate impact on improving access to high quality and affordable coverage for all Americans. I thank our witnesses for being here with us this afternoon and look forward to their testimony. And, Mr. Chairman, while I am closing, I know that there are a number of members of the Committee on Reform and Oversight who are not members of the subcommittee who may wish to participate this afternoon, and I ask unanimous consent that they be allowed to do so. Uh, without objection. Uh, thank you, Mr. Davis. Uh, Chair would recognize uh, Dr. Gozar. Uh, so ordered. The Chair would recognize uh, the gentleman from Arizona, Dr. Gozar, for his uh, opening statement. Chairman Gowdy and Ranking Member Davis and our tireless committee staff, thank you for holding this important hearing today. And I look forward to dwelling into the important issues at hand. And thank you also to our witnesses for sharing and appearing today on our behalf. Almost one year ago, the President signed into law what he and the House majority at the time called comprehensive health care reform. At the time, House Speaker Nancy Pelosi said, we have to pass a bill so we can find out what is in it. As we learn more about this immense piece of legislation, we find it gives unelected bureaucrats unprecedented ability to dictate the parameters of an individual's health care. It also dictates what type of coverage small business owners can offer their employees. Needless to say, there is much cause for concern. Specifically, Section 1001 of this onerous law eliminates lifetime and annual limits on the amount of coverage a health insurer is required to pay. It turns out that millions of Americans use these annual limit plans and are satisfied with them. So the Office of Consumer Information and Insurance Oversight, CCIIO, was instructed by the Secretary to grant waivers to this elimination and therefore allow businesses to continue offering annual limit plans. On March 14, 2011, CCIO Director Steve Largen, Larson, who is here with us today, said, for the first year, we will set up this fairly straightforward, simple process, and we are now in the process of evaluating the plans out there and what is the best guide path to 2014. I think that today we will discover that, indeed, the waiver process was not straightforward or simple at all. On March 23, 2010, the so-called Health Care Reform Bill was signed into law. Only three months later, on June 28, Health and Human Services issued an interim regulation creating a Section 1001 waiver. On September 3, the agency issued further guidance listing vague criteria through which individuals and employers could qualify for a waiver. On December 8, HHS finally issued a waiver application. Yet even without this application, HHS granted over 300 waivers. How? What day was the first waiver granted? To date, over 1,000 waivers have been granted to Section 1001, saving 2.4 million Americans from being kicked off their health care coverage. I submit to you, ladies and gentlemen, that HHS has not whatsoever made this process straightforward or simple. Take, for example, on the screen HHS's website above. There is no provision on the home page for a waiver application or even for OCIIO, which is now called CCIIO. Or is it E-I-E-I-O, which I feel like old MacDonald had a farm with these acronyms? Let's assume that you are well acquainted with this arduous process to search for O-C-I-I-O. It turns out O-C-I-I-O has a home page. And if you click to the bottom of that page, follow us along, and scroll all the way down to the bottom left, you will see regulations and guidance. Far from clear to the average Joe, who turns out to need to click right here. Under regs and guidance, see annual limit waivers. 
Under annual limit waivers, there are four, count them, four guidance regulations. Good luck, good luck combing through those. As you can all see from this demonstration, there is a long way to go and a lot to examine before we can claim to have a transparent, easy process for America's job creators to navigate this law. Add in the cost. Where did, where did the money from CCIO come from? Was it shifted from our priorities in HHS or CMS's budget, like dialysis centers and other services for the needy and sick? How did these special waivers find their way into the earliest days of this timeline without a waiver process? Were special favors involved? Why wasn't a blanket waiver issued as with other flawed parts of this attempted government takeover of health care? These are a mere samplings of questions I hope you are ready to answer. I know inquiring minds throughout America want and need to know. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Dr. Gozar. Um, I am going to ask unanimous consent to insert in the record. Um, HHS produced to this committee uh, guidance conserving standard operating procedures. I would ask unanimous consent to insert into the record the HHS guidance governing standard operating procedures. Hearing no objection, um, it is so ordered. I will now uh, recognize the ranking member of the full committee, the gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Cummings. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and to you and to our ranking member. Next week is the one year anniversary of the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act. This landmark health care reform bill prevents insurance companies from denying children health insurance because of pre existing conditions prevents insurance companies from dropping beneficiaries simply because they get sick, provides small businesses tax credits to extend coverage to their employees, and provides seniors with a 50 percent discount on brand name drugs through Medicare Part D. Another significant improvement this law made was to direct the phase out of so-called mini med insurance plans that place restrictive limits on coverage. These plans provide meager benefits and often leave patients high and dry when they become ill or are involved in an accident. For example, a Wall Street Journal article in September 2010 featured a prominent fast food chain that offers its hourly employees a limited benefit plan that caps annual benefits at only $2,000. This plan covers almost nothing when someone needs uh, serious medical care. A single trip to the hospital could cost tens of thousands of dollars and leave beneficiaries without coverage or with extensive out-of-pocket costs. In July 2009, the New York Times featured a story about a man whose limited benefit health plan capped hospital services at $10,000. When he had to have a heart procedure, his insurance plan covered only a fraction of the $200,000 hospital bill. As a result, he and his wife were forced into bankruptcy like many Americans, despite the fact that he was supposedly insured. Former health care executive Wendell Potter referred to these plans as essentially fake insurance. The reality is that people with many med plans often do not realize how, how terrible their health insurance is until they get sick or hurt and really need it. The Affordable Care Act directed the phase out of these deficient plans, but it also gave the Secretary of HHS authority to create a waiver process. This is a temporary fix to help employers that offer many med plans whose premiums would increase in the short term with an, ab an abrupt uh, transition to high or no annual limit plans. In 2014, waivers will not be necessary because consumers will have access to comprehensive coverage through State health care exchanges that reduce premiums by increasing competition and spreading risk. There have been allegations on the Republican side that the HHS waiver process has been neither transparent nor fair. But the facts do not bear this out. According to agency data, HHS has approved waiver applications for 1,040 plans and rejected only 65. The overall approval rate is 94 percent. Allegations that unions have received preferential treatment also appear unsubstantiated. 
According to the same data, HHS approved 85 percent of waiver applications from union plans or plans serving union members and 97 percent, 0.4, of non-union waiver applications. Unfortunately, today's hearing seems to be a little more than a do-over of a hearing that was held last month by the Energy and Commerce Committee. The same allegations, the same documents, even the same HHS witness. At that hearing, Ranking Member Henry Waxman issued a memorandum analyzing 50,000 pages of documents, pr documents provided by HHS that found no merit to these allegations. I would like to make that memo a part of our official hearing record. The memo also pointed out that various industry applicants were, in fact, very happy with the waiver process, thanking HHS repeatedly for their prompt and courteous attention. Mr. Chairman, our committee can play a positive role in making sure the Affordable Care Act is implemented effectively and efficiently. Rather than using the one-year anniversary to criticize a process that has been incredibly flexible and favorable to, to the industry, let's work together to make sure that the real health insurance coverage is extended to 32 million Americans who do not have it today. And I am very pleased to see one of our witnesses, uh, Steve Larson, who uh, played a major role when I was in the State Legislature uh, in Maryland for 15 years, and he has served many, many roles. But I can say that of all the public services that I have worked with, he is one of the most honorable and honest and efficient and effective public servants I have ever met. And with that, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Cummings. Uh, the Chair would now recognize the Chairman of the full committee, the gentleman from California, Mr. Issa. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. As the Ranking Member said, another committee has looked into this problem, and it is a problem when over 1,000 waivers need to be granted, whether it is 94 percent, 85 percent, or 100 percent, you ask, is the Patent Patient Protection Affordable Care Act ready for prime time? The answer clearly is, it is not. It was ill-conceived, run through in a manner that Speaker Pelosi wisely said, let's pass it so we can find out what is in it. That, in fact, is the reason that these thousands of pages are only now being analyzed to find out that compliance is not available. And contrary to what the ranking member said, it is likely that a year from now waivers will continue to be granted in a year from now and a year from now. Why? Because, as President Obama has admitted, it is hard to bend down the, the health curve. It is hard to do some of these things. And, in fact, many of the, uh, the goals of the uh, Affordable Care Act will not ever come to pass. Health care continues to spike and spiral up. What, it, what was considered to be a Cadillac plan based on dollars just a year ago would now be undoubtedly a Bentley plan. As we look at this on every committee of jurisdiction, including ours, let us bear in mind that 2 million workers out of uniform and another million workers in uniform are part of a government health care plan uh, that we oversee. Additionally, Indian health care and plenty of other plans continue to have the problem of spikes in cost with no likelihood of abatement. Our committee has a responsibility to find ways to ensure and protect Federal workers through an affordable health care plan. We additionally have an obligation to see that this law passed live up to its goals or be rescinded. As the committee looks at this in light of its post-passage spike in cost and the admission by the President himself that the, the, the cost curve is, in fact, not being bent down, that 16 million, not 32 million, uninsured Americans will be covered, and they will be covered based on Medicare, one of the most inefficient delivery systems that we can find. So this committee is dedicated to, one, being honest about what a law is or isn't doing, two, seeing that, in fact, inefficiency in government goes away. As most members of this committee are becoming acutely aware, Medicaid is not the right way to provide health care coverage, and yet we continue to see waivers for conventional systems that were vilified during the, the legislation. Well, we see an expansion of Medicaid, one of the least affordable, uh, from a cost standpoint, ways to provide health care. It is, in fact, in my State of California, well known 
that Medicaid patients are actually more likely to show up at an emergency room than the uninsured overall. This and other factors tell us that we need to look at all aspects of this, not just the 1,040 applicant uh, granted waivers. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I thank you for doing our committee's work. I would uh, reserve a point of order on the ranking member's request to put the work already in another committee into our record. I believe it is uh, our practice uh, to put limited amounts, and if there is a specific citing that the uh, ranking member would like to limit to, I would re remove mine, but to simply put Mr. Waxman's uh, full activities in, I think would be inappropriate. He left this committee. He is in another committee. It is in his record. With that, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the Chair would now recognize the gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Clay, for his opening statement. Thank you, Chairman Gowdy. And, uh, when a, when a party is in the minority uh, without the authority and responsibilities of the majority, uh, some nuisance tactics are, are to be expected. Uh, but being in the majority changes things, or at least it should. Take, for instance, the title of this hearing. The use of the term Obamacare is not helpful in any way, and I think purpose fully provocative. We all know that using a negative, catchy term for the President's signature pro domestic program, a program that affects each and every American in many positive ways and fundamentally reforms health care in this country for the better, is red meat for red states, and we all know that. But the Affordable Care Act protects sick people from being dropped by insurance companies because they get sick. If my Republican colleagues believe that insurance companies ought to be allowed to drop sick people from coverage once they get sick, then they ought to say it. The health care reform legislation protects people from being denied coverage by insurance companies because they have pre-existing conditions. If someone really believes that insurance companies ought to be able to deny coverage to people with pre-existing conditions, they should say so. Health care reform, an unfulfilled dream of both Republican and Democratic presidents for decades, means positive changes for virtually all Americans. If you want to roll back the progress that we finally achieved, and leave Americans without health insurance, without health care, without health, you should tell the American people that straight out. But clearly it's unhelpful to use misleading terms and slogans like death panels and Obamacare. Reducing the President's signature domestic program, one that benefits all Americans, to a misleading term detracts from real oversight. It's also unfair. It would be like Democrats reducing the previous administration's signature domestic program that benefited all Americans. The, well, if someone could remind me what that was, it would be unfair to call that program a negative nickname, too. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Clay. Uh, I would uh, point out that people within this very administration have called this piece of legislation Obamacare, and I do not recall any moral outrage at the use of the terms Bush tax cuts, Bush wars, Reaganomics, or Carter malaise. Uh, that were, so that anyone were who does not, for, or Medicare Part D. That was anyone who doesn't for. want to use the phrase Obamacare does not have to. None use. of it was paid for, or called, or or uh, or, or implemented by tax reform. So, I mean, what, what does Mr. it mean Clay? anyway? Are you through? I'm through. Um, I'd like to welcome uh, the witnesses at this point. Uh, and it's, uh, well, let me also say this. Members may have seven days to submit opening statements and extraneous material for the record. We will now welcome our panel of witnesses. We'll start with Mr. Steve Larson, who is the Deputy Administrator and Director of the Center for Consumer Information and Insurance Oversight at the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Previously, he has 
served as the Director of Oversight at the Office for Consumer Information and Insurance Oversight when it was within the immediate office of the Secretary of HHS. Uh, moment of your indulgence. With your indulgence, I will introduce everyone, and then we will start with you, Mr. Larson, and, and go, if that is okay with our witnesses. Uh, next, uh, and I will apologize in advance, uh, my South Carolina uh, upbringing may not allow me to pronounce uh, Hazelmeyer correctly, um, if that is, well, I am willing to get it right if you will correct me and tell me what it is. It is Heiselmeyer, but I even have relatives who call it Heiselmeyer. Well, <laughs> Heiselmeyer. Ed Heiselmeyer is a Senior Research Fellow at the Center for Health Policy Studies at the Heritage Foundation. Scott Wold is an attorney at Heitzman & Wold, an employee benefits law firm located in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Mr. Wold's practice focuses almost exclusively on employee benefits. Ms. Judy Fetter is a professor at Georgetown University, where she also served as dean of Georgetown's Public Policy Institute. From 2000 to 2008, she is currently a fellow with the Center for American Progress. Welcome to all of you. I will now uh, recognize Mr. Larson for his. Uh, let me let me swear you first. Um, I thought I was getting away from that when I left the DA's office, but um, let me find the oath. All right, I'm going to get you to all rise, raise your right hands. Do you? Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give this committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Let the record reflect all the witnesses answered in the affirmative. Uh, we will start, Mr. Larson, with you, recognize you for your five-minute opening statement, and then we will move from my left to right, your right to left, and finish with Dr. Fetter. Okay. Uh, thank you, Chairman Gowdy, Ranking Member Davis, and members of the subcommittee. Thank you for the chance to appear before you this afternoon. My full testimony has been submitted for the record. I serve, as was mentioned, as Deputy Administrator at CMS and Director of the Cons Center for Consumer Information or Insurance Oversight, or SOSIO, uh, within CMS. Um, since taking on this role, I have been involved in implementing many of the provisions of the Affordable Care Act, including overseeing private health insurance reforms. Uh, establishing the health insurance exchanges and ensuring that consumers have access to information about their rights and coverage options. Uh, prior to becoming Director of SOSIO, I served as the Director of the Office of Oversight, uh, which worked with the States to implement the new insurance rules. As Director of SOSIO, I am committed to improving the health insurance system so that it works for consumers and businesses both now and in 2014 when consumers and businesses will have more quality health care options. As part of improving the current health insurance system, the Affordable Care Act ensures that consumers are provided meaningful and reliable coverage for their premium dollars by phasing in restrictions on the annual limits and insurance policies between now and 2014, the subject you have asked me to discuss today. Right now, about 160 million Americans get their health insurance through an employer. However, not all coverage offered by employers is the same. A very small percentage of empl employees are offered policies with low annual limits, caps on the amount of benefits that are provided under the policy in a given year. Often these policies are uh, provided by employers who hire low, lower wage, part-time, or seasonal workers. While having such limited coverage may be better than no coverage at all, this coverage unfortunately can fail those that need it most. These policies can have high deductibles and annual dollar caps as low as $2,500. Some are better with $5,000 or even $25,000 in coverage, but in the case of a serious illness or accident, the coverage can be adequate. In 2014, consumers will be able to purchase fuller health insurance coverage in state-based exchanges. But in the time between now and 2014, we need to maintain the coverage for the small percentage of employees with these limited policies until better options are available, are available for them in 2014. Immediate compliance with the new Affordable Care Act provisions on annual limits could cause disruption of this coverage. The Affordable Care Act specifically directs the Secretary to implement the restrictions on annual limits in a manner that ensures continued access to coverage. This is accomplished by phasing in the annual limit restrictions for most policies, and for this year we established a waiver process. All employers and insurers that offer limited benefit plans may apply for a waiver if they demonstrate that there will be a 
significant increase in premiums or a significant decrease in access to coverage without a waiver. Applying for a waiver is simple, basic, with only five elements that SOSIO has clearly published on our website. It is important to note that more than 30 percent of applicants have fewer than 100 enrollees. Small businesses are able to take advantage of this as well as large ones. We administer the process fairly without regard to the type of applicant or size of business. We have published our standards for reviewing the applications uh, in the regulations implementing the law and, again, in the bulletins implementing the regulations. The vast majority of waivers, more than 94 percent, were granted to health plans that are employer-based. Of the waivers approved, 41 percent were to self-insured employer plans, 31 percent to HRAs, 23 percent to Taft-Hartley plans. These are employer plans governed by collective bargaining agreements, 3 percent to issuers. Only 2 percent of waivers have been granted to union plans. The limited benefit plans for which waivers are allowed cover an extremely small portion of people who have employer-sponsored coverage. Since setting up this waiver program, SOSIO has granted waivers to plans covering less than 2 percent of all covered people in the private insurance market. The vast majority of employers who applied for a waiver have also reacted to the application process positively. We have been open to feedback from applicants, and based on their input, we improve the application process so that it is timely and responsive to their needs. Thank you for the privilege of appearing before you, and I would be happy to answer your questions. Thank you, Mr. Larson. Mr. Heiselmeyer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. In keeping with your uh, opening remarks uh, that the policy issues are for other committees, and in particular the Energy and Commerce Committee, which would have jurisdiction, I am not going to address that. But I will note that in my prepared remarks, I did give a brief overview of the policy issues just to give the members of the committee some background. And there has been some discussion of the policy issue here. In that connection, I would simply like to make one point that came up in some of the members' statements. And I think uh, it is somewhat relevant here as a policy background. When you look at the statute, uh, Congress's intent in this uh, is unclear. Uh, there, you know, to say that Congress intended to phase out these uh, program, these plans is actually not true. There is no evidence that Congress intended to do that. This was not in the House bill. There were no hearings on this provision that I am aware of in the Senate bill. Uh, so there is no, th that may have been the intention, but there is no evidence. Uh, one can also say there is no evidence of the other, to, that there was any intention to exempt or preserve these things. So Congress has presented a uh, piece of statute here that is unclear. That is the first point. The second point is, uh, with regards to Mr. Larson and others who have discussed a phase-out, it is important to understand that the phase-out that Mr. Larson and others are discussing is, again, a construct that HHS comes, uh, comes up with. There is no uh, requirement, suggestion, or, or uh, any other uh, element in the statute with respect to a phase-out. Now, what we get to in the end of my testimony and what is really at the heart of the question that this committee, I think, is dealing with is whether this whole process is actually appropriate. And I think that is a valid question. And in looking through the statute and the regulation, I was able to find, uh, in, in my view, no actual explicit justification for HA just taking the actions that they have done in doing the waiver. So regardless of what one thinks about these particular plans, what one thinks about whether Congress intended to get rid of them, intended to keep them, intended to do it quickly or later, the question relevant to this committee is, does HHS have the authority to do it? It does not appear to me uh, that they do, but I am you know, open to hearing the arguments of people who maybe have more expertise in regulatory law than I do. Um, the other question that occurred to me is, well, could a reasonable case be made by HHS that whether it had authority or not, Congress had put it in an impossible situation in the statute and that the agency or the department could only resolve that statute through the waiver process? And as I indicate in my testimony, again, I don't find that to be the case either. Congress seems to have simply asked HHS for one very simple thing, to fill in a number. Uh, Congress uh, decided that instead of setting a dollar limit in the statute for the interim years, that it would delegate that to HHS to come up with a number. 
Uh, that is what the statute plainly says. So uh, interestingly enough, HHS came up with three numbers. Uh, when I read the regulation, I was just looking over it again here while I was waiting. I don't see in the regulation, maybe Mr. Larson could point to me if I missed something, any explanation of how they arrived at the numbers of 750,000 or 1.2 million or 2 million. Uh, indeed, the table of data that they present, which I'm not questioning the data, but the breakouts aren't according to that. I mean, the breakout is, you know, uh, half a million dollars to a million dollars. Well, how did you get 750,000, which is in the middle? I mean, there, there's nothing that tells me. So that there's no idea in here as to where these numbers came from, why they did a three-year phase out. All Congress asked them to do was set an interim and one interim number. So clearly, in my view, the statute doesn't require this, and HHS could have responded to the requirements of the statute by simply taking the analysis in the regulation, saying, based on the foregoing analysis, the number prior to 2014 shall be and set the number. Everyone would then have known what it was and could determine on their own whether they needed to comply or not. Um, finally, the question is a public policy question of whether this kind of waiver process is appropriate or desirable in public policy. I would argue for several grounds that it is not desirable for this particular kind of a waiver process in public policy. Uh, while there is no evidence I am aware of of corrupt practices, it certainly invites the, the, uh, the temptation or the opportunity for favoritism. Uh, it certainly does provide for unequal application of the law, and it furthermore creates the perception and possibly the fact that the regulatory process is being used uh, or subordinated to political ends as opposed to simply enforcing the law that Congress wrote. So I think there are many reasons to question the suitability of the entire process. Thank you for your patience and your time, Mr. Chairman. I will be happy to answer questions from the committee. Uh, thank you. Mr. Wool, we will recognize you for your five-minute opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. <clears throat> uh, as you mentioned, I am an uh, employee benefits attorney, and on a daily basis I work with employers, both large and small, with respect to their employee benefits plans. And so uh, in the last year since the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act was passed, as you can imagine, we have spent a large amount of time working with this particular law as it applies to our clients and their plans. And um, I'm here today to talk about one particular aspect of that experience over the last year, and that is with respect to the waivers from the annual limit restrictions. Uh, first, a, a note about how, uh, as an attorney, I became aware of this, this program or this process. Uh, we did review the, the legislation, or at least the parts of the legislation that applied to uh, employer benefit plans. Uh, and we did very closely uh, monitor regulatory uh, implementation or, or uh, when the regulations came out, we took a close look at those. And so the first time I learned of the possibility of a waiver program was in June when the regulations on the annual and lifetime limit restrictions were published. Uh, noted in reviewing those regulations that there was a uh, authority given to the department to issue a, or create a program providing waivers for certain types of plans. Um, the regulations didn't contain a lot of detail, and so we didn't really learn much about the program itself until later in September when the first uh, piece of guidance was issued regarding the program itself. Uh, as an attorney, we uh, subscribe to a number of different um, benefits news uh, uh, publications, I guess I would call them. Typically, they're, they're online. And so we get uh, either daily or weekly, we get informed of different developments that are occurring in the employee benefit area. And so it was through those processes that we learned about the uh, guidance being issued with respect to the waiver program. Um, and we, we, of course, went out and reviewed it. I'm not aware uh, whether it was publicized in any other way, but that's how I became aware of it. And, and as an attorney, we, we certainly monitor those types of things. Uh, one, of the, one of the things that we did, then did was we worked with a number of employers in applying for the waivers. And most of our experience uh, was not in the context of mini-med plans. There has been discussion of mini-med plans and how the waivers are applicable to them. 
we do have clients with mini med plans and have applied for waivers for those plans, but a number of our clients and most of our experience in this area has to do with health reimbursement arrangements. Health reimbursements, health reimbursement arrangements are not traditionally thought of as mini med plans. They are typically used to supplement other group health plan coverage. They are an account-based defined contribution health plan, and so the employers will make those available so that employees can have dollars to use to reimburse out-of-pocket expenses. And HRAs have really been, uh, I would say, largely ignored in this whole process. They are group health plans. They are subject to these rules in general. And in the preamble to the interim regulations, uh, there was a specific exemption provided to certain health reimbursement arrangements, something called integrated HRAs. The problem was there was no definition or any guidance provided what, what an integrated HRA is, and so there has been a, a lack of clarity in the uh, benefits community about which, a, which HRAs are subject to these annual limit restrictions and which are not. In addition, uh, it was never clear, at least from the published guidance, whether HRAs could apply for waivers. Uh, the guidance talked about mini-med plans or limited benefit plans, but there was no mention of HRAs. And so we did some investigation. We called the department and, and got informally got an answer that, yes, HRAs could apply for these. And that is how we were able to go through that process with, with our clients who sponsor HRAs. Uh, the difficulties we experienced, especially with our clients who sponsor health reimbursement arrangements, suggest to me that maybe the waiver process was not the best method to go about providing this relief. I don't disagree that um, or I, I won't take a position on whether the relief was actually needed or a good idea, but I think once it was decided that some of these plans would have time to uh, continue to be maintained as they were, uh, the waiver process created a number of challenges to employers, and, and there may have been a better way to do that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wold. Uh, Dr. Fetter. Thank you, Chairman Gowdy, Ranking Member Davis, members of the subcommittee and the committee. I am glad to be with you today. Uh, I am happy to testify on the Affordable Care Act and its implementation because of its importance. An ever-growing body of research tells us that assuring Americans affordable health care and affordable insurance matters enormously to their health and well-being. As you noted in the outset, almost exactly a year ago, the Affordable Care Act, or ACA, was enacted to provide that assurance. The law assures most, if not all, Americans essential health insurance coverage by building upon not replacing the current health insurance system, securing what works and fixing what doesn't. Today, about 170 million Americans get health, care through, health insurance through employment. The Affordable Care Act strengthens job-based health insurance through consumer protections, like the prohibitions on annual or lifetime limits on benefits, and through penalties on employers with more than 50 employees whose employees use newly available tax credits to purchase insurance directly because their employers do not offer affordable coverage. According to the Congressional Budget Office under the ACA, job-based coverage will remain in the future the primary source of health insurance coverage for working Americans that it is today. At the same time the Affordable Care Act secures what works in providing health insurance, it fixes what is generally recognized as broken, the non-group health insurance market. Although in theory people who do not get coverage through their employers can buy it on their own, in practice the non-group market is, a is not a safety net. On the contrary, insurers survive in this market by attracting and assuring that they attract consumers when they are healthy and avoiding us when we are sick. To address this problem, the Affordable Care Act takes what is often referred to as a three-legged stool approach. You need all three legs to make the stool work. Unless we require health insurers to take us all, regardless of our health needs, without extra charges for pre-existing conditions, people will be not denied coverage they need. And insurers can only accept all comers if they can expect all of us to buy insurance when we are healthy, not to wait till we are sick. And we can only expect everybody to buy health insurance if we provide, if they get help to pay those premiums if they can't afford them, the help the ACA provides in the form of tax credits. 
The Congressional Budget Office estimates that with arrangements under the ACA, about 19 million people will be covered through health care exchanges and receive tax credits by 2019, and that another 16 million people on co top of coverage projected by, uh, under pre-ACA law will be covered through Medicaid. This Medicaid expansion reflects another fix in the ACA. Today, the same low-wage workers whose employers don't offer coverage have been denied Medicaid benefits as well, no matter how low their incomes. Fortunately, the ACA brings an end to this discrimination by extending Medicaid at full Federal expense to all individuals whose incomes fall below 133 percent of the Federal poverty level. Though sorely needed, changes in our health insurance system can't take place overnight. The ACA is designed to strengthen and extend the health insurance coverage Americans count on, not to disrupt it. The law recognizes that building new marketplaces will take time, and until the full set of new insurance rules and subsidies are in place, people who have inadequate coverage may want to hold on to it despite its limitations. Therefore, the administration has been willing to grant waivers from some of the law's early requirements, which, if fully imposed, might leave some people with nothing. The aim of the law's early requirements and benefits is to make matters better without making them worse until the full law goes into effect in 2014. Far from indicating weaknesses in the Affordable Care Act, these wa waivers reflect its strength in matching requirements with capacity. It behooves administrators of the ACA to be sensitive to disruptions alongside improvements and to assure a balance that enhances people's protections as the law intends. And it behooves overseers of the law's implementation to recognize the big picture. The enormous problems the Affordable Care Act was enacted to address, it is designed to strengthen what works, fix what is broken, and avoid unnecessary disruption, and its potential, when fully implemented, to end discrimination based on pre-existing conditions and assure most, if not all, Americans access to affordable health insurance coverage. All of us should be working to make sure that we move as quickly and as smoothly as possible to get us from here to there. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. on this subcommittee is our desire to be good stewards of your time, as well as the time of the people who are gracious enough to be with us. I am informed that votes are imminent. So what I would propose uh, to Mr. Davis and to my colleagues is that we continue on until votes are called, that we adjourn um, long enough to go cast our votes, and then that we come back and we do it as quickly as we can to be good stewards of your time. Thank you. All right. I will uh, recognize myself for five minutes at this point. Uh, Mr. Larson, I am not going to spend uh, any time uh, quarreling about the uh, statutory authority for waivers. I am not even going to discuss the substantive aspects of, of the health care law. What I want to focus on is the waiver process. Uh, can you tell me when the waiver process was first made public? Yes, thank you, um, Congressman. Uh, I think, as was mentioned, the, the regulations that um, identified uh, the phase-in of the annual limits as well as the waiver process uh, were published, um, the interim final rules, in June. Uh, and within 90 days of that, I think on September 3rd, uh, we published uh, the first bulletin um, that laid out uh, the waiver process and that laid out what we think were, you know, very simple and straightforward uh, provisions of the application process uh, for the public. I think it was uh, mentioned that there wasn't an, an, a quote an application initially. Uh, in fact, in order to make the process very simple, uh, we just laid out the types of information that an applicant could provide, and later on, as we got more applications. Uh, to improve the process, we did develop a, a, a form that people uh, were to use online, a, a spreadsheet, if you will, 
Let's, um, let's assume it's September 3rd. Were there applications for waivers that were made prior to September 3rd? Not to my knowledge. Were there waivers granted prior to September 3rd? Not to my knowledge. I mean, we didn't, we didn't have the application process set up. That's my point. Right. Are you sure there were no requests for waivers prior to September the 3rd, 2010? Oh, requ requests for waivers? Request. Applications, request. I've been advised that there were, there were three. And what process did you use, given the fact that there was no public process that had been promulgated at that point for those three? Yeah, I, I assume that they were held until we set the process up. That's my assumption. And when you say process, are you referring to the regulation that used the word large and significant, the, the words large and significant? No. When I say set up the process, I'm referring to the bulletin that we issued in September. That was when we identified uh, that there was a process in place. So we issued the reg, and then we established the process through what we refer to as subregulatory guidance, which is the bulletin that we put out in September. So your testimony is that there were three applications, whether that's formal or informal, for waivers prior to September of 2010. That is my understanding, but I'd like to confirm that for the committee. Okay. Um, so how did the companies know the process before you promulgated the regulations? Well, again, the regulations were issued in June. And I would say the regulations did two things, among many others. This was part of a, a, a broader regulation. But with respect to the uh, annual limits provisions, we established the, the kind of the, the tiered phase in for annual limits starting um, a after looking at what was happening in the marketplace and what types of annual limits were out there. We established for the first year the 750,000 uh, restricted annual limit. Uh, and again, it's very important to note that the statute specifically contemplates that there will be no annual limits in 2014, but what it refers to as restricted annual limits. Well, I wasn't going to go to the statute, but if you're going to okay. bring it up, you'll also have to concede nowhere does it grant the Secretary the express power to grant waivers. Well, I'm, I'm not sure I would agree with that because the, the, the clear uh, reading of what is there is that there will be a phase in of the annual limits provisions. Well, <laughs> the word waiver does not appear anywhere in the statute. Would you agree with me there? Well, I will agree that the, that the word waiver does not appear in that particular section. Okay. Um, well, that's, but, the, one, but, that's but I, the one we're talking about. But I think that, but I don't think that's, as a lawyer at least, the normal test for whether uh, it's reasonable to uh, interpret well, the statute to speaking provide. of a lawyer, speaking like a lawyer, let me ask I you I know this. you're a lawyer, sir. Well, not much of one. I was just a prosecutor. <laughs> let me ask you this. Um, it, if there's a denial, what is there an appeals process, and, and, and what burden of proof does an applicant have to make to, to be uh, considered, rejected, and then considered again? It's, it's actually, we do have a, re a reconsideration process, and again, it's, it's a very simple process. We consistently were guided by the principle of making this as easy and as simple as possible. So we advise applicants uh, that if they are uh, denied, they can ask for reconsideration, and we will work with them to, inf uh, to collect whatever additional information uh, we need to look at the application again so there, there isn't a hard and fast burden of proof because our goal in implementing this provision was to ensure that employees could continue the coverage we had. So we didn't, we didn't want to make it burdensome. In fact, um, if we had to make a choice, our, our objective would be to err on the side of making sure that people could continue their coverage. So we weren't out to, to die people. In fact, we wanted to make sure that people could continue their coverage. I've run into the red light, so I will um, now recognize uh, my colleague from the State of Illinois, Mr. Davis. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. You know, I was just thinking, I know people who swear at lawyers, and I know others who swear by lawyers. So uh, it just depends on who you are looking at. And, but, Mr. Larson, let me uh, ask you, the new health care law is intended to phase out what we call mini-med plans. These plans provide low benefits and often leave consumers high and dry. 
when it comes to actually using them to access medical care. We have heard many horror stories about people who rely on these plans, thinking that they are insured only to get sick or have an accident and be left with nothing. In July 2009, for example, the New York Times featured a story about a man whose limited benefit health plan capped hospital services at $10,000. He had to undergo a heart procedure, and his hospital bill was $200,000. When it came time to pay, his plan provided next to nothing. So he and his wife were forced to declare bankruptcy despite the fact that he was supposedly insured. Mr. Larson, some might conclude that these plans should be prohibited immediately. Can you tell us simply why do we need these waivers at all and why not just prohibit these horrible plans outright? Yes, sir. And <clears throat> What you describe, I think, is, is the dilemma with these plans, because they provide some coverage for the employees that can purchase them. But in, in too many cases, they don't provide sufficient coverage or people don't understand that, in fact, they don't have coverage. So with a day or two in the hospital, they've reached their limits. These really are a bridge to uh, 2014 when fuller and more comprehensive and affordable coverage will be available. Um, we want to make sure that although this is not great coverage or good coverage in some cases, um, it is some coverage and we want to make sure that people can maintain access to that coverage through this process. So the waiver process permits individuals to continue that type of coverage until better coverage is available in 2014. Now let us take a look at the, the other side of this argument. There are those who have argued that since you are proven 94 percent of the waiver applications, that means the underlying health care law must be flawed. For example, my good friend Representative Cliff Stearns, Chairman of the House Energy and Commerce's Subcommittee on Oversight and Investigation, puts us this way, and I am quoting. He asks if the law, that is, the Affordable Care Act, is so good why are so many waivers to the law being granted? I mean, how do you answer or respond to that? Well, I, I would respond that, that in this case the waiver provision that was contemplated in the statute shows that the law is in fact working because it allows employees to continue this coverage, uh, this Remember, it is a small percentage of employees, less than 2 percent. Most people who have coverage have much more comprehensive coverage. This allows them to continue it. Uh, so I would argue or submit that it shows that the law is working because for the majority of policies that can meet the annual limits with minimal impact on premiums, they will do so. And the goal, the statutory goal, is to ensure that uh, we are phasing out the annual limits in 2014. And then why won't the same employers that are seeking waivers today seek them in 2014? Well, at that point, um, we'll be much farther along in the reform of this very broken health care system. I mean, it's, it's important to keep in mind that, that these fixes are the result of a broken system where people are denied coverage for being sick or they're having their policies rescinded or they have limited benefits. So in 2014, more comprehensive, affordable coverage is available for employees of small businesses and individuals. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Larson. It just reminds me when my father was explaining the difference between how people see things. If you ask, is it fair for birds to eat worms, uh, you get a different answer based upon who you ask. If you ask the bird, you get one answer. You ask the worm, you get another answer. And I guess they both feel that they are right. I hope I am the bird. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Davis. Uh, Chair would recognize the gentleman from Arizona, Dr. Gozar. Mr. Hansen, uh, when did Health and Human Services first know about the 2 million Americans when they would lose their health care coverage, even if they liked it? When would you first know that 
2, 2 million Americans would lose their health care based upon this, this provision? I am not sure I am following your question. Well, let us go further. President Obama clearly said if you like your health care plan, you can keep it. Um, well, limited and many med plans provide some coverage to about 2 million people, true? Um, about 1.8 to be exact. But the law as written um, and the law as it was understood, and we are talking about attorneys. Now, I am not an attorney. I am a dentist. 7-Eleven, Lowe's, National Restaurant Association, National Retail Federation, the U.S. Chamber of Congress said, in their opinion, the bill as written eliminated this health care coverage, period. True or not true? Not true. I mean, as I described earlier, it, it does two things. It sets up a phase-in of restricted annual limits leading to no annual limits in policies, but preserves the ability for this small part of the market that has very, very low annual limits to continue until we get to 2014. Did you know those groups met with the Secretary for Health and Human Services in June of last year about that very issue? Um, I don't think I did. We had, we had meetings with groups as well to talk about uh, the development of the waiver process. Um, so I don't, I don't know who met with the Secretary specifically. Who all was involved in developing the, the waiver process? Well, we developed the waiver process, HHS. Just on your own? No outside in inference at all? No, no, no. no. Our, our staff developed it. We looked at the regulation. Um, we met with stakeholders who had an interest in the process. Um, we took their suggestions to heart, which were to keep it simple, um, to make it easy to apply, um, to make it prompt so that it didn't take too long. So I think we did all those things, 30-day turnaround time. Uh, again, we think it's simple to use. We have gotten a lot of positive feedback from uh, a number of groups that, in fact, it is very straightforward. Mr. Wold, the whole process of this waiver, would you call, call it uh, cumbersome or straightforward? I would say somewhere in between, probably. I mean, in, in some cases, it, it worked very well for our clients, and in other cases, it didn't. I mean, there were certainly issues with respect to identifying, you know, what information needed to be provided, at least for the early applications that we submitted before the application form was released. We developed our own kind of template form that we used and, and you know, based on the guidance that was in existence. Um, and so in, in some cases that worked. In other cases, uh, our clients heard back that, no, you need to provide some additional information or, no, we have this form now, you need to provide that. So there was there were some cumbersome aspects to it. If you were trying to help people along, trying to work with them, would you put uh, the waiver form on the sixth page hidden away in the, your uh, web-based web, uh, uh, application? No, I, I wouldn't, no. I mean, I, and, and when we worked with our clients, we issued uh, what we call a client alert to all of our clients, notifying that, them of this uh, waiver process. and. You know, we had found the link, obviously, by that time and, and included the link, but uh, I would have made it more prominent, yes. Okay. Um, so if, if, if you were from outside Washington, D.C., God forbid, <laughs> maybe back out in Arizona, California, whatever, this is an arduous process, is it not? I, I think it is for the average employer, yes. I mean, and in part, that's why they come to benefit attorneys to, to help them with that process. But I think you know if you were if you didn't have the the means to hire a benefits attorney or didn't have a third party who's an expert in in the benefits field, uh, I think for the average employer it would be arduous. So, Mr. Larson, we spent some considerable effort based upon this um, web design. We spent a lot of time and energy trying to incorporate um, the waiver process. Did we not? Did, did it, it came at quite an expense, expense and time. I'm sorry. What to was develop the, the waiver process and to put it on the web, on a web-based system it took I some time. No, I would not. You mean for HHS? Mm -hmm. No, um, I would not describe it as a, a large expense. We had a number of staff working on it. Um, again, we tried to keep it simple. Um, we put it on the website. We put out a press release. Um, I know that you know many many benefit consulting firms, TPAs, because most small businesses even 
and larger businesses have their benefits administered by these third-party administrators who uh, w all indications we got were very familiar with this process, were aware of the process. Um, I'm not aware of a, a feedback that we got that people were not aware of this or troubled by it. Even Mr. Wold found it. Uh, he spoke with HHS people. He got his questions answered, I think. Uh, I don't want to speak for him, but I've, I've read his testimony. Um, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Dr. Gozar. The Chair would recognize the gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Cummings, for his five minutes of questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Larson, uh, some of your critics have raised questions about the Secretary's authority to issue waivers that allow limited benefit plans to be extended and gradually phased out by 2014. For example, in February, in a February 10, 2010 letter to you, Chairman Issa said that it was unclear which section of the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act grants authority for HHS to waive the statutory provisions that in limited benefit plans. As I understand it, the Affordable Care Act added Section 2711 to the Public Health Service Act. There is a clear language uh, in that section that states, and I quote, the Secretary shall ensure that access to needed services is made available with a minimal impact on premiums, end of quote. Is that right? That is correct, sir. And that is where you get your authority? And we think that authority is clear in that provision. As I understand it, this section gives the Secretary authority to pursue a mechanism to phase out limited benefit plans by 2014, but, it, but to, do, to do it in a way that, is, that has minimal impact on those plans. Under this provision, the Secretary issued an interim final rule that explains in detail uh, that issuing short-term waivers would help phase out these plans with minimal impact. Is that right? We did both phase, phase out annual limits and, and reference the, uh, the waiver process for mini-meds, yes. You know, and I, was, I, you know, I thought about this a uh, bit. You, you seem like you'd be damned if you do and damned if you don't. If you don't give some people some leeway for these many, many med plans to continue, people will say uh, you threw people out of their insurance. On the other hand, when you uh, provide a waiver for them to uh, continue with them, um, they say that the program doesn't work, uh, although it doesn't, it's not supposed to be fully functioning until 2014. Um, that is a, a bit of a dilemma. Would you agree? You don't have to agree with what I just said. I'm just wondering. I, I mean, I, I, just, I, I mean, I was. I think I, I've I, said previously that I think that had we not been granting waivers for these small number of low limit policies, people would be arguing that the law wasn't effective. And so we are, as the president suggested, allowing people to keep their coverage through 2014, uh, and it's specifically contemplated in the statute. And so it's being suggested that we're uh, not following the law, but. Now, your office was given responsibility to issue this guidance and address applicant questions and review applications for suitability. Is that right? Is that part of your job? Yes, sir. Um, and the committee staff reviewed hundreds of pages of comments submitted by interested parties regarding the waiver process. Uh, they had trouble finding any submissions and indicated concern with the Secretary's authority to issue the waivers under this provision. Did you know that? I, I'm aware that, in fact, most uh, if not all the comments are supportive of the waiver process. So, so, you know, generally I would assume that the industry supports the waiver process? It does. Yes. How do you know that? You haven't had complaints from the industry? Well, I am sure they didn't come running into your office saying, hallelujah, we love this. Well, we have gotten comments on the interim final rule which were supportive of the waiver process. And in the course of administering the process as well, uh, we have received positive feedback. Um, both from individual applicants and uh, trade groups associated with businesses that need waivers. Now, some critics have suggested that the process by which annual limit waivers have been issued is biased and favors certain groups such as unions. For example, in February 20, the February 10, 2010 letter to Secretary, the Secretary, Chairman Issa made this statement, and I quote, the current process gives credence to the perception that bureaucrats are picking winners and losers in a politicized environment where the winners are favored constituencies of the administration. Uh, is that accurate? That is not true. We do not favor 
uh, any particular type of applicant or any applicant from a particular sector, and we've applied the standards that we set out um, fairly across all the applicants. Is uh, political support for the Obama administration or health care reform a factor your office uses in evaluation, evaluating uh, applications for annual limit waivers? It is not. And you, you understand you are under oath? I do, sir. And um, I think that would, that'll be it. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Cummings. The Chair would recognize Dr. Desjardins. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Dr. Fetter, I guess we'll start with you. I was listening to your testimony, and, and you seem pretty confident about the uh, upcoming success of the Obamacare, or ACA as you call it. How would you rate the government's uh, management of the Medicare system right now? Of the Medicare system? Mm -hmm. I believe that the Medicare system, or I know that the Medicare system is extraordinarily effective in assuring access to affordable health care for the nation's seniors and those people with disabilities it covers, and has been so for some years. And that does not mean it does everything right. And the uh, one of the advantages of the Affordable Care Act is the uh, new mechanisms it creates to, um, to reform payment in the mechanisms in Medicare to make it much more efficient. You think Medicare is efficient and financially stable right now? I, I think that health costs are rising. Medicare is actually, its rate of growth in health care costs per capita has actually over the last m multitude of years been slower than growth in the private sector. Do you think health care costs are going to stop rising? I think that we are going to have to do everything we can to make us get better value for the dollar in the system. Medicare has in the past been a leader in that effort. The private sector has followed when Medicare has been okay. a leader, and I think that is what we need again. Do you think Medicaid is a good system and it is financially stable? I think that Medicaid is, um, when you talk about payment, Medicaid is paying as very low rates. Is it a broken system? No, no it is not a broken okay. system. It is enormously value in providing, it is the nation's long-term care safety net and enormously value for covering those that it protects. Okay. So you think that the, the Federal-run programs right now, Medicare and Medicaid, are doing pretty good? Just I think when you, you went, what I said was I think that they are enormously valuable and, and in terms of protecting people. They are not re, uh, more, um, uh, they, relative to the private sector, they are doing, if anything, better in terms of efficiency, but I think we need to improve everybody. Okay, that's a, that's a good point. You think it is doing better than private sector. Do you, know, of prior of, to, do, do of you know that prior to uh, the implementation of Obamacare, that uh, approximately what percentage of Americans rated their health care as good or excellent? I would have to check. About 75 percent. Okay. You, how many people uh, is the Affordable Care, Health Care Act or Obamacare supposed to cover? I mean, what, the, what was uncovered? The Congressional Budget Office is that it will expand coverage by over 30 million people. Okay. And you said that 19 million would go on? Uh, 19, 19 million in the exchange is receiving In the exchange credits. and another 16 million would Correct. go on Medicaid? Yeah. Okay. So you, if you break that down, that's, uh, I guess my math is correct, about 35 million people that you are saying are uncovered right now? That I'm, say, I'm saying that the Congressional Budget Office is they, it says these will be additional people who will receive coverage, okay. the expansion of coverage. Well, the fact that we're having this hearing today about waivers uh, would make me feel that maybe the Health Care Act itself was flawed and now we're trying to find a way to, to make it look better. Uh, you know, I guess I have grave concerns about the fact that the systems right now, in fact, we are about to go vote on, on a way to keep the country running because, as we all know, we are broke and our deficits are increasing at remarkable rates, but yet somehow we think that we are going to add people to a health care system and decrease cost and increase quality. Well, Do you really believe that I, with increasing health care costs? What I would say, only reiterating what the Congressional Budget Office found, is that the law is fully paid for, that it actually slows the growth in Medicare, in, in, in Medicare spending, uh, and that it covers people at the same time. And I think that that is the right thing to do. Mr. Hausmeier, you haven't had a chance to talk much here. Do you, do you have any opinion on any of that? No, I, I mean, all, all, all of the foregoing is not true, I suppose. Um, the, the, uh, the, the hearing really is about health policy, uh, not about health policy, but about this waiver process. And I, I, the only thing I would add on the waiver process, we, I could debate with Dr. Fader some of her comments all day. Uh, I, I just want to make it really clear for the committee, there is no mention of a waiver in that uh, portion of the law, as uh, Congressman Cummings cited. In fact, the 
preamble to the sentence, uh, Congressman, is in defining the term restricted annual limit for purposes of the preceding sentence, the Secretary shall ensure that access to needed services is made available with a minimal impact on premiums. So the instruction to the Secretary in the statute is purely to define a term restricted annual limit. It doesn't even contemplate a phase-in. Mr. Larson, some other members, Mr. Davis, had uh, made the comment that this was intended to phase out. It may have been. If it was, we don't know. The reason we don't know is there is nothing beyond the statute to give congressional any indication of congressional intent. This was added later in the Senate version of the bill. There were no hearings on this. So whether it was or wasn't intended, there is no phase-out in here. There is no waiver. And finally, uh, Mr. Jarlis, I could direct your attention to one of my footnotes in my paper where I cited that, in contrast, I found 21 uh, subsections of this legislation, Papaka, 21 subsections of this legislation where explicit new, not existing waiver authority, because there are many more that refer to existing waiver authority, but explicit new waiver authority was deliberately granted by Congress to the Secretary of HHS. That is 21 separate other sections. And there are more instances, because in some sections, waiver authority was granted in more than one place. And there was also examples where waiver authority was granted to other departments outside of HHS. So my point is simply that if Congress had intended for this to be a phase-in, it should have said so. If they intended for it to be a waiver, they should have said so. They did neither. HHS has exceeded its authority, regardless of what one thinks of the policy. And I have offered how you could either abolish mini meds tomorrow or you could wait till 2014. I put in my testimony there are three different ways to do it. Thank uh, you. Uh, thank you. Uh, given the fact that the bell is sounding, we will uh, recess for votes and we will reconvene um, as quickly as we can all reassemble. Uh, thank you. So what kind